Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar for Laser and Skin Surgery Center of New York. I am very excited to be here today with Dr. Bernstein. He has a phenomenal presentation prepared for you all to learn about skin cancer screenings, treatment, and Mohs surgery. So I see a lot of you joining. I'll let you get situated for a moment. Um, you are joining the Laser and Skin Surgery Center webinar on skin cancer screenings, treatments, and Mohs surgery with Dr. Bernstein. Um, on, if you are calling in from Zoom or on Zoom on the computer, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A feature. And that's the, a great place to start populating any questions you might have for Dr. Bernstein. You can ask them throughout the presentation while he's speaking or at the end when we get to the Q&A portion. There's also a chat feature if you have any questions for me. And otherwise, I, um, we are gonna get going in one moment. I will introduce Dr. Bernstein and then we will get started. So thank you all for joining us. I, okay, I think hopefully most people have joined. So I am very excited to introduce Dr. Bernstein. He's a board certified dermatologist he has been with the Practice Laser Skin Surgery Center for over 25 years, so we're so lucky to have him. He actually grew up in Chicago and did most of his training at um, Northwest University. And even though today he's speaking about skin cancer and Mohs surgery, I wanna make sure everyone knows he is, um, he does offer a full service of cosmetic dermatology treatments as well, which include injectables and lasers and body sculpting. And of course, as with all of our webinars, I wanna reinforce that we have a number of board certified dermatologists at Laser Skin Surgery Center, and many of them um, treat skin cancer, and many of them are also most surgeons as well. So you are in good hands no matter who you come to at the practice. So without further ado, Dr. Bernstein, welcome. Hello there, thank you very much. Um, I wanna say thank you for joining us today, and I'm. Sorry to disappoint anybody who thought I was going to do West Side Story performances tonight. It's a different Leonard Bernstein. Um, we're not doing tummy tucks. We're not doing lifts today. It's a little different. I'm just back talking about skin cancer, basic stuff that's really important. Um, so it's not as glamorous as some of the things you may have seen on the other webinars, but it's really important for you to, uh, to know about. So we're going to talk about skin cancer screening, the treatment, Mohs surgery, and we'll show some pictures. So basic skin cancer screening. Um, why do we do it? I mean, obviously, non-melanoma skin cancer, unfortunately, is very common. It's getting more and more common every year in this country. Over 5 million new diagnoses every year. 2,000 de 2, deaths a year from non-melanoma skin cancer. Other squamous cell carcinomas, Merkel cell carcinomas, sebaceous carcinomas. We'll talk about more about these types of skin cancers later, but it is significant, and we have to be cautious about uh, our skin and, and, and sun protection, which we'll talk about. 20% of the population will develop skin cancer by age 70. So it doesn't affect just people who are out in the sun. Uh, it affects a lot of people uh, over a period of lifetime, a lifetime of sun exposure uh, and other exposure. So it's important to have your skin looked at. If you're an organ transplant patient, if you're immunosuppressed, if you've taken medications because of uh, connected tissue diseases or lymphomas, leukemias that uh, lower your immune system, it makes you more likely to develop skin cancers like squamous cell carcinoma. Melanoma skin cancer, uh, it's obviously one that people are familiar with and very scared of. Uh, it's unfortunately uh, also increasing in number, 200,000 new diagnoses annually in the U.S., 7,000 deaths associated with it. Um, luckily, over half the new diagnoses are superficial. We're catching these things sooner uh, and able to treat them and hopefully cure them uh, in a faster manner. Who should get screened? Pe adults, people over 25 years of age, spend a lot of time in the sun, if you're a sun band, sun tan uh, uh, person, a, a sun uh, tan bed person, it definitely increases your risk for skin cancers. As I mentioned, if you're immunosuppressed, if you have a family history of melanoma, because there's definitely a genetic component, if you have a large number of irregularly shaped moles, some people have a syndrome called dysplastic nevus syndrome, which increases your risk for certain skin cancers. If you have a past history of skin cancer, uh, if you had past, Lots of atypical looking moles, maybe get your skin looked at twice a year instead of once a year. And if you have melanomas, we'll actually be coming more frequently uh, in the first five years or so, just to make sure you don't develop a new skin cancer because you are at increased uh, risk of developing new cancers if you had past cancer. Who should do it? 
kids too, uh, not just adults. If you have a strong family history of melanoma, kids should be looked at too. Uh, some have this dysplastic nevus syndrome, which is a, an autosomal dominant trait. Uh, that means uh, if an adult, adult has this trait, 50% uh, of their offspring uh, can also develop the same trait. So it's important for children, uh, for people who have dysplastic nevus syndrome to have their skin looked at. And the giant congenital nevus, this is not just a large mole. These are moles that cover up large portions of the body. We call it bathing suit distribution. These have a significantly higher risk for melanoma. Moles that kids are born with that are just slightly larger, uh, they should be watched, but they don't have a, a significant risk of, of increased melanoma. How do you do it? You go to your dermatologist. We're experts in, in all diseases of the skin. Uh, most surgeons like myself and my colleagues in the office, we're cutaneous oncologists. We specialize in skin cancer. Uh, we take care of skin cancer and we uh, deal with other aspects of, of dealing with wounds and um, um, dealing with scars as, as, as the wounds are healed. Skin examinations are done here in the office. Um, we do telemedicine now because of COVID-19, but this is far inferior than actually being in person. We like to touch the lesion. We like to look at the lesion. We use certain devices that help us look into the lesion uh, more clearly and help define what the, what the problem is. Examination should be done from head to toe, looking through the hair, looking through the toes, uh, looking under the nail polish, making sure there's no streaks under the, under the nail polish. Uh, these are all potential areas for skin cancer and people look just on my back or just on my chest, but you really have to look at the entire body. Dermoscopy, I'll discuss in a minute, is a device which we can actually look more closely at the pigment patterns in the skin uh, and help define whether a mole is abnormal uh, or whether it's a simply a normal mole. People use body photography. We'll take pictures of patients who have funny looking moles to follow them over time to see if they're changing. There are companies that do this professionally like MoleSafe where they'll catalog all the moles uh, on a person's body with photography and dermoscopy, which is that specialized uh, close look at the moles. Uh, and we can see if there's changes over time. So this is one, one way of monitoring funny looking moles on bodies. And of course, biopsy, we take, the, we take the lesion off and we look under the microscope in the laboratories uh, and give us a de definite diagnosis of whether this, this lesion is good or bad. Optical coherence tomography and reflective confocal microscopy we'll discuss in future webinars. These are devices basically that we can look through the skin like a microscope and we can look straight down and, and define whether a lesion is abnormal or normal sometimes and we can also look at and sometimes define the border of, of where the tumor is so that we can help speed up the process of its removal. Dermoscopy, I mentioned, this is something you've, if you've been in my office, you'll see that we'll, we'll go ahead and use this on moles, just a, a light that we put out right up against the surface of the skin and we can look more closely at the moles. If you look at this mole here in the, in the middle, it's an irregularly shaped mole, which we'll talk about the ABCs in a moment. But you might look at that mole and say, oh my gosh, I have melanoma. When we look at our dermoscopy, we see there's a very normal pattern. It's very what we call a reticular pattern of the, of the, of the pigment cells. And, and this is what we call an ink spot lentigo. It's just a sunspot that we acquire through too much sun exposure. On the right, we see what a melanoma, a melanoma looks like under the dermoscope, uh, dermatoscope. And this is, we see clumping of the cells. We see a blue veil uh, in the middle here. These are signs, clear signs of melanoma and will give us an indication this lesion needs to be biopsied and examined more closely. The ABCs. You've probably all heard of the ABCs of moles and melanoma. What are they? A, asymmetry. If you put a line down the middle of the mole, we want both sides to look like each other, a mirror image of itself. The borders, we like round, oval-shaped borders. We don't want irregularly shaped or scalped borders. We want a nice, smooth contour. This is a very irregularly shaped contour. And you see some pigment bleeding below the surface of the skin, which we definitely don't like to see. Color, it could be blue, black, brown, red, skin color. Uh, the color doesn't really matter so much as, as, as long as it's one color. When we start seeing mixtures of colors, as I showed you in that dermas, uh, dermatoscope picture a minute ago, when you start seeing blues or grays mixed in with these black colors, it, it concerns us in terms of risk for melanoma. Diameter. Most moles are about six millimeters or a quarter of an inch. When you start seeing moles that are much larger or if they're changing shape, or, which is E evolving, if the mole is changing from a stable state, uh, these are concerns. None of these ABCs by themselves mean it's melanoma. These just mean these are signs you should bring it to your dermatologist's attention. We should look at it, uh, evaluate it, maybe biopsy it, and make sure it's not turning into a melanoma. What about sun protection? Best thing you can do to help protect, protect yourself from the sun is protect yourself from the sun. So as everyone asks SPF value. What should I get? Should I get a 50? Should I get 100? The SPF is just a multiple of how long it takes for your skin to burn. So if you're somebody who goes out in the sun 
midday without any sun expo any sunblock or any protective clothing, and it takes you 10 minutes to burn uh, to get a redness to your skin. Then if you wore an SPF of 30, that gives you 30 times that, or 300 minutes, five hours of protection. So the difference between an SPF 30 and SPF 70 is probably only about two or 3% effectiveness. So the important thing is wear a sunblock, make sure it's at least an SPF of 30. You'll still probably tan a little bit with it, uh, but it'll give you a lot of protection from burning and that's, that's the most important thing. There's different types of sunblocks and sun protection. There's sunscreen, and these are chemicals. These are chemicals that have to interact with your skin prior to the exposure to the sun. It takes a little while. So you can't put it on at the beach and expect to be completely covered in sun protection. These are the ones that you look in the active ingredients and you can't pronounce half the names. These are all chemicals that have to interact with the skin. Some blocks, on the other hand, are the more the mineral-based ones like zinc or titanium oxides. These are physical blockers and they block out the sun uh, rays, ultraviolet rays immediately. So as soon as you put it on, you have protection. So these are, these are probably better blocks. Uh, there's something called grays, which is, means generally uh, relatively safe, for, um, safe and effective, uh, recently uh, effective and safe. And this is, this is definitely seen for the zinc and titanium oxides. Some of the chemical-based ones, the FDA has been looking at the last few years. People have been reading articles about sunscreens not being safe, that they cause cancer, that they cause other issues with hormones in the body. And, and there's possibilities. You do absorb some of these chemicals over time, especially if you're using it multiple days in a row if you're spending time at the beach. Uh, so using a zinc or titanium base is, is probably best. Most of the children, some, some blocks are, are, are the zinc and titanium based, so they are safer. Um, there are also some issues with some of these sunscreens, chemicals uh, in the water in terms of the affecting aquatic life. And some, uh, some states like Hawaii have banned a lot of these chemicals uh, from use or sale uh, in their locations. And lastly is the ultraviolet protective um, factor clothing. And there's companies like Salumbra, Cooley Bar, Solbari. These are companies that sell clothing that protect you from the sun without putting sunblock underneath it necessarily. Uh, so you can cover large parts of your body without covering yourself with layers and layers of cream. Uh, and in the old days, people thought, oh my God, this stuff is the ugliest clothing you've ever seen. But you see, these are actually not so bad. They're stylish, you know, t-shirts, uh, long sleeves, nice big wide hats, uh, and somewhat stylish. So even the kids are fully covered and, and they generally tolerate it well. It means less sunblock for them, they're happy. Uh, they don't get slathered with the sunblock. Now let's talk about non-melanoma skin cancer. What are the risk factors? We talked about sun exposure over a lifetime, lots of sunburn, especially in the youth, because that's when you're having more free time to be out in the sun. Radiation exposure in the past, whether it be um, from uh, procedures or just radiation exposure from um, Chernobyl or some other exper experience of radiation. Uh, history of arsenic ex exposure. This is very old school. Uh, many of our older, older patients who used to use a drug called Fowler Solution, which was an old tonic for all different types of remedies. Uh, arsenic definitely increases people's risk for certain types of squamous cell carcinomas. Old scars, burn scars were thought sometimes to increase the risk over a lifetime of developing squamous cell carcinomas. If you had a previous history of actinic keratosis, which we'll discuss in a minute, uh, these are precancerous lesions. If you have a lot of these, you're probably going to be at higher risk for developing skin cancer uh, down the road. Obviously, a previous history of skin cancer. If you have a genetic disorder, there are certain disorders like uh, xeroderma pigmentosa or basal cell nevus syndrome, where there's actually irregularities in the enzyme mechanisms that help protect the skin um, from DNA harm from the sun. These, these enzymes go along our DNA chain and repair this, the sun damage. And if you have a um, uh, defect in these types of enzymes, you'll develop skin cancers at a very early age. These types of patients generally need sun protection from the day they're born um, um, just to help prevent increased number of skin cancer. There's human papillomavirus, uh, the warts, and certain types of HPV viruses uh, have a higher risk of developing skin cancers uh, in the genitalia and oral mucosa of the mouth. Um, so it's important to be aware of these uh, warts, treat them early and, and monitor for chances, uh, for, ch for changes in the skin. And of course, history of smoking, it's not just bad for your lungs, it's really bad for your skin. Uh, and you can develop skin cancers uh, on the lips. You can develop skin cancers in the mouth uh, from having too much uh, smoke and, and uh, tars in those areas. Now we're going back to school. Now we're going to talk about, this is our, our love and joy, the skin. And the, most, of the, most of the work we talk about here is the skin cancers are up here in the top layer of the skin called the epidermis. Uh, the base layer, or the basal, where the basal cells arrive from, uh, is the base layer of the epidermis. And these cells are kind of like stem cells and they actually divide and migrate upwards uh, to form squamous cells. And these squamous cells finally 
lose their nuclei, lose their, a lot of their proteins and form the top layer of our skin, it peels off. And this process from the bottom base layer to the very top takes about 28 days in normal skin. Uh, but these are where these, these cells come from when we talk about basal cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas. Along the base layer though, there's, there are other cells called melanocytes, and these are the pigment cells. They don't actually derive from the same types of cells as the other two, uh, and these actually form different types of cancers called sarcomas, uh, which is what a melanoma is, uh, and they tend to be a little more aggressive and, um, and have a higher chance for metastasizing and spreading through the body. But most of the skin cancers we talk about, they arrive over here and they spread downwards into the dermis, uh, where they have a chance to potentially spread, where these are the blood vessels are and the lymph channels are. So it's really important to treat these things early uh, as, as, as early as we can find them. So actinokeratoses, uh, these are precancers. These are the little brown, red, rough spots that you see on the surface of your skin. Uh, they're due from light exposure. Uh, and they sometimes have like a rough hue that can be tender to pressing. You can push on them and they feel like a tack on your skin. Um, not an attack, but a tack on your skin surface. Uh, and these are, are precursors of squamous cells. It's really a continuum. These are squamous cell carcinomas that are still in their natural environment, which is the epidermis. About five or 10% of these will develop into an invasive squamous cell carcinoma, which will invade down into the dermis uh, and potentially have the, have the possibility of spreading. Uh, you'll see these actinokeratoses on top of basal cells and squamous cells uh, routinely. When we do Mohs surgery, we're looking under the microscope and we're seeing these often at the edges of these skin cancers that we're treating. But we can treat these easily. There's, many ways of treating with either using a cold spray like cryotherapy, scraping them off, burning them off, or using topical creams and lotions, which we'll talk about. Actinic chylitis is just a uh, uh, more localized form of, of these keratoses, which involves the, uh, the lip, uh, most, most, most commonly the lower lip, because that gets most of the sun. Um, but these, these have a higher risk of form, transforming into squamous cell carcinoma than your typical keratoses. Uh, and that reason it's important to wear sunblock on your lips too. Everyone wears sunblock on their face and their chest and their back, but they forget their lips. So the, you have to use those lip balms with sunblock. Uh, it's really important to protect your, your lip. Now we're going to talk real briefly about the different skin cancers. Basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common, uh, but 70-75% of the non-melanoma skin cancers uh, we see are basal cells. And again, they rise from that base layer of the, of the epidermis. Uh, and they, they can spread downwards. They can, there's 17 or so variants of basal cells and not all one. Um, and they look differently. They can look like pearly bumps, uh, which are like translucent almost, like little, little bumps on the surface of the skin. They might bleed. They might look like a pimple that doesn't heal. Uh, they can be a brown flat patch too. Uh, they can ulcerate and break down the skin. They're usually very slow. They grow very slowly. By the time you see them, they've been there for quite some time. Um, they often are superficial. But sometimes if we don't treat them, we can see they go very deep. They can go down to the muscle. They can even go through bone uh, if they're left long enough. So it's really important to treat these lesions. They're not just warts. They're not just little benign growths that we can leave alone. They do cause problems if left alone. Um, and of course, the major risk factor for these will be sun exposure. And these are different, different pictures. So you can see like, just like a rough patch. Some people might confuse that with eczema. They might treat it with cortisone creams for a little while uh, and find it's not going away before they finally bring it to our attention. This is a more classical pearly papule, as we call them. Um, it's kind of translucent. Uh, this is a nodular basal cell that has an ulceration to it. And this is one over here is, is called a morpheiform basal cell. Uh, it's very scar-like. And some patients will have a little spot like this on their cheek. And I'll ask them, I go, how long have you had that, that spot? And they go, oh, this is just a scar. I've had it for 10 years. And I go, did you have surgery there? And I, no, I didn't have surgery there. Did you have anything there? And they go, no, I don't remember. I just remember the scar. And then we'll biopsy and it'll be this basal cell carcinoma. It's kind of very insidious. It just sits there for a long, long time. Uh, but it's really just small fibers growing through the skin. So it doesn't create a bump and it doesn't draw your attention until finally it, it, it either does bleed or it does develop some surface growth. Moving on to squamous cell carcinoma, second most common. 20% uh, of non-melanoma skin cancers are squamous cell. They rise from the middle layer of the skin, as I mentioned. Uh, often red, red, red patches, red bumps, they tend to be a little more rough than basal cells. Um, there's lots of variations on them. And their, their significance it will be partly, I should say their, their prognosis is partly based on the types of cells they are. If they're poorly differentiated, moderately differentiated, well differentiated, uh, will make a difference in terms of how we want to treat them. Much higher risk of spread than basal cell carcinomas, although it's still relatively small if treated early. Um, and 
also the most common that type of skin cancer we're going to see in, in organ transplant patients or other immunocompromised people. Here's some examples. Again, it could look like eczema. It could look like a basal cell carcinoma. Uh, until you biopsy it, sometimes you can't tell the difference. This is a more classical uh, lesion called a carolacanthoma. It has like a central dell to it. Um, this is a um, rough surface. It feels like a wart texture. And also, also they can break down. So there's lots of different looks to, to skin cancers. There's not one, one answer to everything. Uh, a less common skin cancer, I'll just mention briefly, dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. We like to have big words, so we call it DFSP for short. Um, very slow growing tumor. Uh, they rarely spread through the body, but they do grow deep and they grow, and they grow wide. Sometimes you'll see on the surface, it's kind of like the iceberg, the classical iceberg. And you'll feel around the edge of it and you'll see that it's actually firmness to the skin spreading well beyond the, the site uh, that you're looking at on the surface. That, and sometimes these, these tumors can spread centimeters, like maybe two inches, an inch and a half to two inches beyond the border of what you're looking at. And these usually affect people age 20 to 50 uh, on the trunk, um, but they can affect, uh, I've seen them in all different body areas. And they look like this. This is like a, this is like a sperm tumor on the surface of the skin. And if you look, feel underneath the skin all the way out to here, the border goes way out there. So it's really important that if you're seeing new growths on your skin that are a little unusual, have them looked at. Uh, the worst case scenario is you say, oh, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but it's important to get to these things as early as you can. Merkel cell carcinoma, really briefly, a very rare form of skin cancer, only about 3,000 cases annually, but it's very aggressive. And it can spread uh, quickly and it, can, it, it is very deadly in its in sense. It's a high mortality rate mostly people over 50 years of age, men more than women, uh, sun exposure and previous history of skin cancer are risk factors. Um, and treatment often includes excision plus radiation and often chemotherapy as well, because it's a very tough tumor. If caught early, it can be totally cured. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we wait uh, way too long to catch these, these types of lesions. And they can look like, like a red bump on the surface of the skin. We see them often on the, on the head and neck area. Um, and these are t tumors to get to as, as soon as possible. Melanoma. Um, only about 5% of cancers, uh, skin cancers are melanoma, but, but they're the highest uh, cause of death of, of, of skin cancers. Um, it's increasing in the, the incidence, but at least the mortality rate is decreasing because we're catching these things earlier. As I mentioned, about 200,000 cases annually in this country, half of them are in situ, just on the surface of the skin. Um, and they can look like an asymmetric, irregularly shaped colored growth. As we mentioned, the ABCs, you look at those things, um, on your surface of your skin, if you see something funny, we definitely need to look at it. Uh, there's different types of skin cancers. Um, they don't always arise from moles. In fact, they rarely arise from existing moles. Most derive de novo out of your skin. As I showed you, every 10th cell on the, the base layer of the skin is a melanocyte. Any one of those can turn into a melanoma. So it's not just the ones that are collecting in groups that we call moles. It's ones that we see um, um, by themselves on the surface of the skin and usually not associated with old moles. What are the risk factors? Obviously, sun. Tanning beds increase your risk of developing melanoma by 75 to 80%. If you go once or twice, that's enough. It increases your risk for melanoma. It's very important to avoid tanning beds. That's why they were forbidden for kids under, uh, for children under 18 to use without parental um, um, guidance. And we really strongly encourage no one to use tanning beds. They're definitely not safe. Uh, genetically, there are our genetic tendencies. We do see running families. Uh, it's important to people, especially dysplastic nevus syndrome, uh, they have a higher risk for developing uh, melanomas. If there's actually a family history of melanoma in people with dysplastic nevus syndrome, they'll actually have a lifetime increased risk of uh, almost 100% of developing melanoma. As I mentioned, the giant congenital nevi uh, have a lifetime risk of about 6 to 20% of developing melanoma in those larger, large moles. But not all melanomas are pigmented. About 5% of the melanomas that we see don't have pigment. They're just red bumps. They look like the basal cells or even squamous cell carcinomas. Those are the ones that often stick around longer so they can go deeper and those are the ones that cause more trouble. So what types are there? The superficial spreading type is the most common type. Often what you typically want to see like the black irregularly shaped ones. We see them on the back, on the legs and women, backs and men. Um, Lenticle malignant melanoma is the one that looks like just a very large irregularly shaped sunspot in someone's cheek that they've had for years. If I saw a brown spot like this on someone's face that only had one brown spot, I'd, I'd be concerned. If they have lots and lots of brown spots, then perhaps it is just a funny looking brown spot. But you need to have these evaluated. 
Acrolentigous melanoma is a specific type of melanoma that we see usually on the palms or in the soles, under the nail plate. We see them more often in people with darker skin color. These are the ones that can be deadly too because people aren't really looking on the bottoms of their feet. Uh, this is the type of skin cancer that killed uh, Bob Marley many years ago. Nodular melanoma, most aggressive type, making up about 10 to 15 percent of melanomas. And these are the ones that grow deep. They're not just superficially on the surface, but they tend to go deep fast. So examples, the superficial spreading type. This is the lenticle malignant. It looks like a brown freckle, but it has a little bit of irregular pigmentation to it. A nodular amelanotic melanoma. And then this is one on the bottom of the foot. You see it's a very regular shape. Um, and you can see the uh, location. The prognosis, we won't go into too much, but it has to do with, with we stage the melanoma. The deeper the melanoma in terms of how deep it is from the surface of the epidermis, um, the deeper it goes, the, the higher the risk for, for mortality. So it's really important to catch these lesions early. We check lymph nodes if they're deeper lesions uh, using our surgical oncology friends uh, to, to help us uh, determine those lymph nodes. And if there's distant metastases, we'll also work with oncologists for these patients. What are the treatments? We're gonna go back away from melanoma for a second. What are the, some of the agents? We can treat with topical agents for some of these precancerous lesions and some, some, even for some um, um, superficial skin cancers. We can inject chemotherapy drugs into the skin. We can use photodynamic therapy, which we'll talk about briefly in a moment. Cryotherapy is the freezing techniques. Electro desiccation and curatage is a simple scraping of the surface of the skin. We can excise the lesion, radiation therapy, and of course, Mohs surgery. So what are the topical agents? 5-fluorouracil or Effidex cream, uh, Imiquimod, Aldera cream, Ingenol, which is Bicato, one of the newer agents. These are used drugs that we can use on keratoses, these red, red patches on the skin, they're precursors. Um, we use these, these lesions, these, these creams and lotions to try to destroy the tissue without causing too much uh, injury to the skin. But there is inflammation. Uh, so you do get scabby and crusty. These are examples of all three of these, these um, medications. Uh, we expect you to be red and scabby for a couple weeks. Uh, you might be pink for another week or two after that. Uh, unfortunately, this is important to get rid of the lesion. We need to irritate the skin to get rid of the lesions. Um, but I give you a caution about this. When we started treating skin cancers, uh, we have to worry about the depth of the lesion. So these work great for superficial lesions. My partner, Dr. Geronimus, uh, published a paper many years ago about what lies beneath. And we looked at, hmm, these patients are using some of these topical creams, and this is an example of a, somebody used imiquimod or Aldera cream. They clear the top surface of the skin. The skin looked clinically clear, but when they did a biopsy, they looked deeper down uh, in the tissue, you actually see the basal cell carcinoma just sitting right underneath the skin. And that will sit there for quite a while before you start seeing it visibly pop up again. It might be two or three years. But meanwhile, it's had a chance to grow deeper uh, and perhaps wider and cause a bigger eventual wound when, when it has to be treated eventually. Injectable chemotherapy. Some of my patients we've treated with injectable 5-fluorouracil or methotrexate, um, especially for patients who are not surgical candidates. Uh, some tumors like caraway canthomas, which is a variant of a squamous cell carcinoma, respond very well to these treatments. We don't have to cut the skin. Um, and sometimes we'll actually use a combination of uh, trying to get this chemical deeper down in the skin without injecting. Uh, for patients that have widespread actinic keratoses where um, we want to get deeper than just the cream can afford. We can actually use something like fractionated lasers or microneedling when we make holes in the skin. And then we apply these type chemicals topically and they kind of seep down through those holes and get to the deeper aspect of the lesions so we don't have those missed spots like we saw before. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, photodynamic therapy. Uh, this is something that uh, was very popular. It's still popular. It's the use of applying a topical medication to the surface of the skin. And this, this chemical is called aminolevulinic acid and it gets absorbed by these abnormal cells faster than the normal cells. And within the cells, it gets converted to this new compound called protoporphyrin 9. And it's a very light sensitive chemical. And when we expose it to blue light or even red lights, it can actually create a radical oxygen state, which means these cells are, these are radicals go ahead and destroy the tissue. So it's kind of like a selective time bomb for these, these precancerous lesions or sometimes these, these superficial basal cells as well. And what we do is we, we tackle just those cells without hurting the normal cells around it. Uh, unfortunately, the cure rates are anywhere between 50 to 80%. It's not 100%. Uh, so there are some missed lesions, and sometimes we'll use this with other combination therapies. Cryotherapy is just freezing. Uh, we bring the temperature of the skin down to about minus 50 degrees centigrade, which is very cold. 
uh, liquid nitrogen creates sometimes blistering and some scabbing. There's some risk for whitening of the skin or scarring of the skin. Um, when we want to go deeper, we can use interlegional probes that go uh, penetrate through the surface of the skin like a needle, and we can actually freeze the skin at deeper depths. But the cure rates, again, by 80 to 90%. Uh, we'd like to see higher cure rates, which is what we see with surgery. Electrodesiccation and curatage is scraping, sometimes for superficial skin cancers like uh, basal cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas in situ. We'll go ahead and anesthetize the area. We'll scrape the area over about three cycles. Uh, we don't evaluate the margins, so we don't know 100% if we got the skin cancer. We can feel these superficial skin cancers uh, when we scrape it, and we usually uh, can de de determine that we've gotten it all, but we don't actually check the margins, which is what we do with nose surgery. So this is a little bit inferior. Uh, the do wounds do heal by themselves, so there's some risk for scarring, of course. The clearance rates are higher than the cryotherapy, but they're still not 100%, or close to 100%. Um, and certain types of basal cells, like I've mentioned, the ones that have like fingers that root downward, the, the morphia forms that look like scars. We definitely don't want to use these techniques because those, are, those have scar tissue uh, or fibrous tissue with them, and you won't be able to scrape them down to their base. A wide local excision is just cutting it out. We take larger margins. Uh, we, we take a certain, depending on the type of tumor, we'll take a margin around the surface of it. Uh, for melanomas, we'll take larger margins around the, the surface of the, of the lesion that we see. And we send it to the lab and we look for under, under the microscope uh, laboratory after the two or three days of processing um, to see if we have all the edges out. Um, we often will close the lesions for, for smaller lesions. If they're larger, we might leave the lesion open for a few days until we assess the margins to make sure that they're clear. The clearance rates approach about 95% for, for these types of tumors. And the reason is if you look at the excision, this is what we call bread loafing. You take this piece of tissue and you send it to the laboratory and they take individual bread loaves, uh, section one, section two, section three, and they make a diagnosis and they say, well, the borders looks clear on around, around two and one and three are clear, but they missed what was in section B. So this is an area where they have the, the, the missed lesion and you can have recurrences because of this. Um, I'll show you the contrast in terms of modes in a moment. Melanoma briefly, we take bigger margins. We take for melanoma in situ, which is just on the surface, we'll take five to 10 millimeter margins. For melanomas that are deeper, we'll take larger margins. Now we're talking millimeters, that doesn't seem very large, but let me show you. This is what big large lesions are. So if you had a five millimeter lesion, which is less than a pencil eraser, I, these are bigger pictures obviously, um, and we take a half a centimeter margin around that, five millimeter margin, that means the width of the wound that we're gonna make is gonna be three times larger than the lesion. If it's a 10 millimeter margin we need because it's a significant depth, that's gonna be five times wider. And if it's a really deep lesion, we're gonna be taking lesions that are 20, nine times larger than the original biopsy site. So some people get a little alarmed when we see, we draw on them what we need to remove, but it's based on getting a wider margin of skin so we can make sure that we have all the tissue and there's no microscopic spread beyond in those missed areas that you see with excision. This is an example of a melanoma in situ. Uh, we took narrower margins, about five millimeter margins. We cut it out. I hope no one gets nervous by the, the, some of the slides you'll see. I should have warned you. This is the tissue. We mark it with a little suture so we know the orientation. When we send it to the lab, this is the biopsy, this is the biopsy lesion before, and this is what it looks like after we sutured. So it's a much longer line than that small little dot, but we need to take large borders to make sure we get rid of the tumor. And this is another melanoma with a larger border, another large line. Um, so this is what we see when we see melanomas. We don't see small little lines. These tend to be larger surgical sites. Radiation therapy uh, can be used for not some of the non-melanoma skin cancers, but for the most part, uh, it's good for patients who are really not great surgical candidates. Uh, the recurrence rates are significant. Uh, it requires you going to the hospital or the, or, the, or the radiology centers multiple times over a few weeks. And there are risks. People do get sunburn-like effects, peeling of the skin, redness, blistering, discoloration. And for younger people, there's a higher risk of developing squamous cell carcinomas 10 to 20 years down the road. Uh, so this is really for an older population of patient who's not a good surgical patient uh, because of health reasons uh, or lesions are too large uh, or, or really inoperable. The clearance rates, as I mentioned, between 50 to 90%, uh, depending on the studies that you look at. Melanoma. That you can sometimes use radiation for, but it's not used really for treatment of the, of the melanoma in terms of curing it. It's more like reducing the size of some of the symptoms. When you have melanomas that are metastasizing areas like the brain and are causing symptoms, uh, by reducing their size, you can improve the symptoms. Unfortunately, it's not a cure, 
uh, but it is helpful. Chemotherapy can also be used for melanoma patients, uh, although no longer because now we use immunotherapy. I won't go through this very much, but there's different types of immunotherapy that we're using. This is done really through our oncology friends, not, uh, not us in the dermatology office. Uh, but these things block different chains or different pathways uh, and how T cells, which are our immune system, actually will go ahead and fight off uh, these abnormal cells. Uh, and oncolytic treatment is using a virus. So I'll take a herpes virus that targets a particular tumor cell, and by attacking that cell, we'll try to get our own immune system to fight off that virus and in process kill malignant cells. And lastly, people have heard about BRAF inhibitors, uh, or MEK inhibitors. Uh, BRAF is seen in other types of cancers. Basically, it's just a control sequence for, for um, cell growth. And when it goes awry, when you have BRAF mutations, um, you can have uncontrolled growth. So we can have to use inhibitors to stop the, those, those pathways. So we won't go too far into that. That's a little more technical. Mohs surgery, this is what we do. This was developed after Fred Mohs um, passed away in 2002. Uh, he developed this back in Madison, Wisconsin. He started using something called um, zinc chloride paste treatment. And he would apply this zinc chloride paste to your surface of your skin if you had a skin cancer. And the idea was to try to keep the skin cancer defect or wound to be as small as possible and to really map it out. So he'd, take a, he'd put the zinc chloride on your skin, he'd send you home, he'd come back the next day, he'd cut it out, he'd examine it on the microscope that time because that process of the zinc chloride processed the skin, and then he would actually go ahead and look under the microscope. If there were still cancer cells, he'd send you back home with another layer of zinc chloride paste, and it would go on and on and on. So it wasn't a fast process, but it was a very thorough process to map out the skin cancers. In the 50s and 70s, they started doing more fresh examinations of the skin. Uh, in the late 70s, they developed the actual freezing techniques and microtomes, so we can actually perform these procedures now with mapping the same day. Uh, and this has really improved um, the, the treatment of skin cancer. So it's a surgical technique. It's best performed by people who have been fellowship trained. This office, there's eight of us. We're all fellowship trained. Most surgeons uh, went to the American College of Most Surgery is our, our accreditation. It's usually a one to two year postgraduate hands-on program where we do a lot of skin surgery. We do a lot of repairs. We learn everything about skin cancer. So the whole process is of Mohs is technically the removal of the skin cancer, the mapping of the skin cancer, the cutting of the tissue, freezing it, staining it, and providing it for the Mohs surgeon to look at on the microscope. That's all the same process done by the same person. Mohs surgeon is the one who looks at the slides. It's not read by a pathologist, which some places do. It's very cost effective. You're done in the office. You're not sent to a hospital. There's no surgical fees for the operating suites. Tumor clearance and closure is performed on the same day, which is most of the time. It's a very rare exception where we have to uh, do a closure the next day or continue the surgery if it's a very complicated case. The whole idea is tissue conservation. All tumor roots are traced and removed through tissue mapping. Um, healthy skin is minimized in terms of removal. We try to take one to two millimeter margins around, healthy, around, around the defect to minimize loss of normal tissue. Um, and this is going to again show you some gross pictures, but a lesion, uh, a small margin taken around that lesion, we take little hatch marks just to show where, where the edges are so we can map it out. We remove the tissue, we place it on a map, we stain it with different colors, red ink, blue ink, red ink, uh, black ink, and even some greens and oranges. So we know the exact orientation, where that cut is made on the skin, surface of the skin. We process them, we freeze them, we put them on a device called a microtome, which is a very, very thin knife to make very thin slices of skin. We can look at them after we stain them under the microscope and we know exactly where we are. We have a map drawn. We know exactly in this situation here, we're looking at the whole, the whole tissue. This one section here, we'll refer to as room A here, has some basal cells. We see these blue nodules deep down in the dermis, which we're not supposed to see there. Uh, and these are basal cell carcinomas. So we still have some cancer in that one section. We'll go back to that one section, which is up here. We've mapped it out. We take a little bit more tissue. Examples of most surgery. We'll also delineate certain special borders here. I marked out where the lip margin was, so I always know where it was. After you numb the skin, sometimes you can lose some, some natural borders. After the surgery is done, we close it up the same day. This is, a, this is an interesting point here. This is a basal carcinoma uh, that was biopsied. We didn't see the patient for a few months, and you see it here, it's just very, some people say, oh, it's healed, it's gone, there's nothing there, but it's still there. Uh, we, the biopsies do not eliminate the cancers most of the time. Occasionally they do, but most of the time they don't. There's still some residual cancer cells. We went in there, we marked out the areas of where the eyelid was, we went ahead and removed the skin cancer, 
we close them up the same day. Three months later, it's, it's still slightly visible and then it'll get better and better over time uh, as, as the skin continues to heal. This is another lesion on the cheek by the eyelid. Big defect, we did a flap here. We rotated the skin from the side so we wouldn't be pulling down on the eyelid skin. Lastly, this is a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, we're seeing a big hole inside the nose. It's not easy, you can't close these edges side to side. So this is where we have to use either a flap, which would be harder to use for him, or a skin graft. We borrow skin from behind the ear. We sew that in place. After three months, we see it's well healed. Sometimes they're not perfect. Sometimes there's a little irregularity in the surface of the pigment, in, in the surface of the, the flap or the graft, and we need to improve it. Uh, back in 1998, I published uh, an article utilizing carbon dioxide laser resurfacing. This is, this is developed uh, in their 94, 1995. Uh, these devices and we, we, we noticed that we can actually go ahead and improve the texture of the skin by just vaporizing the tissue down. Uh, in the early mid 2000s, the fraxel or fractionated lasers were developed um, and they also help in terms of resurfacing the skin. They're not just used for wrinkles, we also use them for scars. Here's an example of a surgical scar on the nose. Uh, it was a mature scar, uh, a woman had a flap performed, it was irregular, it was bumpy and lumpy. Um, we decided to mark it out and do a laser procedure Five months after the first laser procedure, you see a lot of improvement in the texture. These lines are minimized, but there's still a slight degree. So we decided to do a little bit more. So we did another pass. This is what it looks like three days after. It's scabby, it's crusty. It's kind of like you found the street and, and scraped your knee. It's just an erosion. Four months later, those little bumps and lines, unfortunately, it's a little over photographed, I apologize. But the lines are definitely much improved and she's very, very happy with the results. Um, this is again the before and after to see the, the, the contrast. This is a flap. This is a rotation of the skin from the side of the nose down to fix the wing of the nose. Definitely lumpy and bumpy. We don't want to keep the nose in that fashion. We go ahead and take a laser and smooth it out to re reproduce the, the natural contour of the nose. So in summary, what do we do? We have to wear sun protection when you're outdoors. You need annual skin examinations. Um, more, if you have a history of skin cancer, you definitely have to come in more often. Uh, do yourself skin checks. Look at your kids. Look at your partner. Look at your spouse. Go over the ABCs, the asymmetry, the border, the color, the diameter, the evolving moles. If you, see, say some, if you see something, say something. It's just like the TSA. And of course, if you have a scar from a past surgical procedure, uh, these are things we can do. We can improve them with some of the laser techniques that we do here at the Laser Skin Surgery Center of New York. Um, a lot of these lasers were developed here uh, and modified and we do a lot of work and um, it's uh, good for you. So with that, I'll leave you with my, one of the favorite pictures of the 16th hole at Sleepy Hollow Golf Course looking over at the Hudson. Uh, if you're outside in the sun enjoying golf like I do, wear your hat, wear your sunblock, protect yourself, but have fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein. That was incredibly informative. Um, I know for some of you, some of those pictures may have been a little hard to look at, but uh, Dr. Bernstein's shady. He's been doing this for a very long time and it is important for us all to see. And now I'm sure we're all looking at our bodies at everything, probably if you're like me. So we have a number of questions um, for Dr. Bernstein that I'll start with in a moment. If anyone else has any questions they would like to add right now, go to the Q&A on the bottom of Zoom and you can add them in right now. I also encourage you to take a screenshot of the page you see up right now. Oh, never mind. I'll Sorry. pop the phone number. It's okay. I'll pop the phone number um, in the chat in case anyone um, has any questions, before, if anyone's signing off before the Q&A because Dr. Bernstein or any of our board certified dermatologists, we are now open. We have COVID protocols or open for in-person visits and we also can do virtual visits as well. So let's get started with these questions. Um, is, why is a squamous cell more likely to metastasize? Well, it's, you know, in terms of it's, in, it has more of an invasive character to it. Uh, the ones that tend to metastasize are the ones that generally are more, um, poorly differentiated. Uh, they, they grow deeper than basal cells generally do. Uh, and they, as, as a more poorly differentiated, the, the cells are, are more stem shell-ish, if you will. They have the potential to spread through tissue better and spread. Um, so here's a good one. I always wear high sunscreen in the sun, but I still manage to get small white spots on my skin, mostly my chest and arms and thighs. Is this sun damage? Do, do I need a skin check for this? Well, there's two possibilities. I and mean, it's hard to say by just by discussing on, on, on the chat, but the, the two most common causes for whitening uh, spots, whitening on the arms, chest, back legs is 
if you're older, I don't know how old the person is, but if it's, if it's an older person that had a lot of sun exposure, um, they kind of burn out their, their, their pigment cells. And something called, we call guttate idiopathic hypomelanosis, which is just a fancy way of saying you kind of burnt out those pigment cells and you get white spots. But one of the other common things that we see, especially in younger people, um, are you develop white spots in the summer uh, when you get a suntan for the first time because you have, you have a condition on your skin called tinea versicolor. Tinea versicolor is actually a yeast that we all have on our skin, but sometimes they grow in little colonies. And when you go out in the sun, they go from this lightish reddish brown hue to whitish hue because they don't tan. So your body tan, but those areas where they have this yeast don't. So you get these patches and they're very easy to treat. Uh, we use creams like um, antifungal agents that will go ahead and, and, and get rid of the fungus. And then as your tan continues, as you continue to tan your skin, those white spots will disappear. Very helpful. Okay, um, here's a good one. Does laser surgery increase the chances of getting skin cancer? Does laser surgery? No. Um, we've looked at this in many ways, actually. Um, there's lots of different types of lasers, even like pigment lasers that we use for tattoos uh, or hair removal, where we're actually using lasers to treat the pigment of the hair. Uh, there was early question whether we, we are affecting, if we treat over a mole, will we convert that mole into a melanoma perhaps? Uh, and many studies have been done looking at those cells uh, on electron microscopic level, like microscopic, microscopic levels. Uh, and there's really no change in the structures of the cells and, or increased risk for, for skin cancers. Other types of lasers that we use like for resurfacing where we actually induce an injury to the skin, um, they're very minimal risk uh, of, of, of injury to the skin and we're not really burning the skin so much, we're really heating the skin. Uh, and there really have never been any reports of increased skin cancers in any laser treatment. Good to know. Okay, so here we have some questions about scars from Mohs surgery. Um, this is, says, will fillers help with the Mohs scar? Sometimes, you know, if there's a depression, um, we can sometimes use fillers to lift it up. Uh, the downside to, to fillers are either temporary, uh, depending on the location, there can be increased risk. Some people are, are we have to be a little more careful with injecting fillers uh, deep structures like on the nose where the blood vessels are, are um, very close to the surface. But for the most part, you can inject a scar with, with the filler, but it'll last about a year or so. Um, if we use permanent fillers like silicone, there are long-term risks of silicone, um, people developing reactions many years down the road after the injecting. Uh, we generally prefer to resurface those types of scars uh, with lasers like the carbon dioxide laser. You saw that woman nose that I showed you was they had depressions and just resurfacing with laser we were able to make it nice and smooth. We didn't burn the nose down. We actually just stimulated collagen growth and it actually kind of raised up. Um, so injecting is a possibility, but we prefer lasers, I think, in terms of that. Sometimes we'll revise a scar. We'll actually go ahead and do further surgical procedures uh, to change the scar's thickness. We might undermine it, go underneath the skin and defat it or, or, or make it smoother and flatter. So there's many ways. It's not just, um, there's not just one trick for scar revision. Great. Um, with regards to the UV blocking clothing, does normal clothes not also protect you from the sun? It depends on the weave. Um, so very heavy, thick weaves will give you a stronger SPF number, if you will. Um, a regular white t-shirt may have an SPF value between five and 10. Um, not high enough. People still actually had a young man um, who I saw today who had looked like his skin was all even tone, uh, but he had slightly increased pigment on his shoulders. And that's probably from wearing t-shirts out in the sun and you're standing upright, you're getting all the sun exposure on your shoulders. Um, so those areas get darker. Uh, so it's not a perfect sunblock. It's better than going without a shirt, uh, but definitely uh, we're using an SPF shirt uh, will give you a much better protection and they're cool now. Um, they're also, you know, the common Oakley makes them, Adidas makes them. You can buy them on, on um, Amazon, um, all different types of styles. It's not just these three companies. You can buy them from many companies now. There's actually detergents that you can use that will increase the SPF product of your own clothing that you already have. Um, there are, um, in terms of like swimming, because some people say, well, I can wear this out, but if, I'm going to, if I want to go swimming in the ocean or in the pool, I'm not going to wear a shirt. But a lot of these uh, swim shirts are SPF 50, and they're really, they're, they're really tight to your skin. It's like wearing a second layer of skin and you can swim in them very clearly. It's not gonna pull you under. And when you come out of the water, uh, they dry very quickly. And 
uh, is you're seeing them more and more on the beach and adults, they're not just kids. Uh, they're being more stylish. Um, models are starting to use them a little bit when they're not being photographed for paparazzi. Uh, you know, they need to protect their skin. They need to look healthy and young forever. So you really want to protect your skin as, as long as you can, as best you can. Absolutely. Yeah. And those shirts that he's talking about are called rash guards. I actually found one myself on Amazon and it had SPF 50 and I, it's what I wear to the beach. Yeah. Surf, surfers have been using them for years because they're out in the water long, you know, for, for long periods of time and they're, they get fried if they don't have, so they're, they're very used to wearing these, like, they're like almost like body suits for them, mm -hmm. uh, but they give them good sun protection. So helpful. Okay. So are tinted sunscreens any more effective than a non-tinted sunscreen? Not necessarily. It really, really depends on the SPF value. Okay. Um, and so not necessarily. It, it really depends on the ingredients. Uh, most of them are probably SPF 30 or higher. A lot of them are mineral-based uh, sunblocks, uh, like the zinc or titanium oxides. Uh, they tend to be a little thicker, um, wider. And there's a whole bunch. I mean, there's, I mean, every brand out there, Neutrogena, Aveeno, um, Elta MD, which we have here at our office, um, Supergoop, which I bought a couple weeks ago. Um, they're all mineral-based sunblocks. It takes a little bit more to rub them in. It sometimes leaves like, you feel like a whitish hue on your skin. If you keep rubbing it, it goes down. Um, very effective though, in, in terms of, of, of sunblock. And um, I, I personally still use some of the sunscreens, you know, which are the ones with the chemicals that people are concerned about. Um, I should be more concerned about, uh, perhaps for my own use, but I like, I like the, percent, the, the aerosol sprays uh, it doesn't make me break out of my face. So for my face, I'll use those. But I'm also wearing a big hat and I'm wearing sunglasses. <laughs> and I'm not sitting out under the beach in the sand. I'm looking under an umbrella. So, you know, you have to take care of yourself many ways. It's not just sunblock. It's also umbrellas on the beach. I mean, anybody who sits out there on the beach, you know, spread out eagle, looking at the sun, it's like we're not talking on the same page. You really need to protect yourself. Uh, you can have fun at the beach. You can go swimming in the water. Be under the umbrella. You don't need to get sunburned. Okay, how about, um, do you have any thoughts on HelioCare, the pill that you take? Yeah, that you know, HelioCare has been around for a little while and people take it. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge proponent of it. Uh, I'm not against it. Um, I know some of my, my, my partners here at the office uh, use it themselves and they have their patients use it. Uh, it does seem to offer some protection um, for the skin. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on the degree though. Okay, um, so do sunburns increase your risk of skin cancer? Is yes. there any, how much, do we know how yes. much? Uh, significantly. Uh, the more sunburns you have, uh, the higher the risk. There's not a particular number you can give. We just know that uh, patients who've had a lot of sunburns, especially in their youth, uh, will definitely have an increased risk of, of developing skin cancer over their lifetime. And usually it's, you know, it's not the next day. It's not the next year. I see people, I got a sunburn last month and I go, well, don't worry about it for another 20 years. It takes time. It takes time to really cause the damage. Now, as we get older and, uh, you know, I see, well, I'm 70 years old. You know, if it takes 20 years, I'm going to be 90. Who cares? The reality is, is you've had a lifetime of sun damage and every sunburn you do basically adds upon the past sunburn. It causes more damage to that DNA chain. Uh, we didn't really go into it too much, but the DNA is, you know, the, the helical structure in, in every cell and it sends the code to every protein and every part of your, your cell function. And, when you get hit by ultraviolet rays, it actually goes ahead and binds two of those cross links, that, that chain, there's two chains, double chain, double chain, and the double strand, I'm sorry. And it blocks it. It creates like a, what we call a dimer, binds those two. So when the natural enzymes that go along the surface of the skin um, to create the proteins that we need to, for cell function, they get to that point, it's like, a, it's like a kink in the road. And all of a sudden the protein doesn't form correctly. Now, if that was a protein that was needed for forming a regulatory protein that causes cell growth or cell death, and you've messed that up somehow, then all of a sudden that skin cell can turn into a cancer cell, perhaps. We actually have enzymes that go along that double-stranded DNA chain, as I mentioned earlier, that fix those, those dimers, those, those kinks, in, in the, because we all get ultraviolet exposure. Um, but as we get older, some of those enzymes get older too, and they don't work as well. And we have a higher risk for developing cancers as we get older. So it's important. It's a lifetime issue. It's not just one sunburn. Each sunburn can build on itself. So if you, you, you kind of hit that, the ultraviolet hits that one particular chain on the, on the gene that causes a particular function and you mess it up, it's a problem. 
Okay. Sorry for that long story. <laughs> no, that's, that's really helpful. We have a few questions left, um, all really good questions coming in. So now someone's asked about that. What, what about the sun and getting vitamin D? It's important to get vitamin D, of course. Um, but you don't, need, you don't need to burn for it. Uh, you really need about 20 minutes or so of sun exposure. And you can get that on your arms. You don't have to burn your face. You don't need to get wrinkles. You don't need to get brown spots. Because this, this is what scares people. Wrinkles, brown spots, um, scars from surgery. You don't need any of that. You don't need to get skin cancer on your face. So you know what? If you go outside and get 20 minutes of sun exposure uh, on your arms, that's great. Or your legs. But you don't need to burn yourself doing it. And the important thing about the sun is you don't have to be out during the peak times. Peak times of the sun exposure are 10 a.m. to maybe 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon, depending on where you live. And, you know, if you're going to the beach, you're going to go do some fun stuff outside, ride your bike, go for a run, go earlier in the day, go later in the day when the sun's not as, as, as bright, uh, you'll have less damage. Um, so, yeah, you can get some sun. You'll, you'll get sun at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you'll get vitamin D formation, but you're probably less likely to burn. So you have to be smart about it. You do need sun but you don't need too much. Okay, so this might be too specific, but I'll try. Um, this person says, can Aldera be sufficient to treat um, AKs and basal cells on the crown of the head? So if they do treat AKs, uh, actinic keratosis, I guess are the pre-squamous cell carcinomas. We see them in association with basal cells and squamous cells, and it can, but it's interesting. We didn't go into too much depth. It's in this slideshow, and you look at the webinar later, you can look, look at it more information, but Imiquimod is not a chemotherapy drug. Uh, it's not an irritant drug. It's a drug that actually tries to stimulate one's own immune system to fight off that abnormal cell. Uh, so some people respond beautifully and, and, and robustly to the Aldera cream but, or Imiquimod cream, but some people don't respond at all because their immune systems aren't up to, up, to, up to the task. So you may not get a response to it or you may get too much of a response to it, but it works for the precancer cells, the actinic keratosis. When you start talking about squamous cells or basal cells where there's depth to it, as I showed in that picture where there's that, that lesion below the surface of the skin, you might treat the surface and you say, wow, it's smooth, it looks great, I'm done. But below the surface was a squamous cell or basal cell just hiding out, waiting to pop up a year from now or two years from now. And then you come in for most surgery and we go, wow, this thing is huge. It's been here for so long. It's like much larger than it had to be. So precancers wise, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm a big fan of a five fluorouracil cream. Uh, it's been around the longest and we have the most experience with it. Uh, people respond to it really well. You do get scabby, you get crusty. It looks awful for two weeks. But afterwards, an eye patient say, I'm gonna kill him, I'm gonna kill him. And then three weeks later they go, wow, my skin is so soft. You know, I wanna do it for my, my spouse wants to do it. What do we do, how do we do it? It, it really works well. It just, you have to plan the time downtime, but it works. Picado, which is, uh, an irritant, um, and it causes cell necrosis as well to target. So there's three, the, the miquimods, the 5 fluorouracils, and, and the new one, the ingenol, which is called Picado. Um, it's nice. It, it causes irritation too. Uh, it's only a three-day application versus I use my Effidex or 5 fluorouracil for two weeks. Picado is a three-day application, uh, so it's shorter. Some people react too strongly, and I'm not happy about it. Um, some don't have enough and I'll have to switch to a different, different agent. Um, but they're all good to clear up lots of these precancer lesions. I'm more cautious about when you have deeper lesions, which you don't always know. Yeah. Okay. A slightly technical question. Is there a difference between dysplastic nevus and melanoma? Is a yes. dysplastic nevus just an early melanoma? Interesting question. Huge, 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 huge controversy, but not too much. So there's different types of moles. There's the, the benign mole that we all like to have. There's melanoma on the far extreme, which is cancer and has a chance to spread through the body, could be deadly. And then there's this big, huge gray zone between. And we call those dysplastic nevi or atypical nevi. And there's different degrees of it. It might be mildly atypical, moderately atypical, or severely atypical. And that's partly that's partly decided based on several features that a pathologist will help uh, tell us uh, in terms of the path specimen that we send to the lab. They'll tell us if, if it's mildly atypical, sometimes we just watch them. Um, if it's moderately or severe, we want to take them off because we don't know if it may eventually develop into melanoma. Uh, we do see melanomas arise from dysplastic nevi, uh, but like I said, we often see melanomas arise from skin de novo without any previous lesion. 
So it's a very big gray zone. It's one of those gray zones that no one wants to take the risk for. So if we said, wow, why don't we do a study where we'll go ahead and take a thousand people with dysplastic knee and follow them for 20 years and see who dies. No one wants to do that study. So there's a big gray issue about what we do with dysplastic knee and we base it on how atypical the cells are. There are some patients who have dysplastic nevus syndrome, but they'll have hundreds, maybe not hundreds, maybe 50 or 100 uh, atypical looking moles. Every single mole on their body looks abnormal compared to what we call, quote, normal. Um, but we're not going to cut them all off. We can't do that. So we look for the most atypical ones and we sample them and we look at, we grade them. And if they're very, very atypical, we will take them off. But they're not technically melanomas. There is something called atypical intraepidermal prolifer uh, melanocytic proliferation or AIMP. And that is, some people call, it's hard to tell between melanoma in situ, which is the earliest phase of melanoma on the surface. Um, and these lesions we treat as if they're melanomas in situ, meaning they're on the surface melanomas. Uh, and they're also important to treat. But not all dysplastic moles are melanomas. And I should say they're not melanomas, period. But they, we, we, don't, we don't know if they may form or transform. And again, you know, this is all, this is partly subjective. And I say that in the sense that there's a pathologist who's a physician who's looking at these slides under a microscope in the laboratory. And he's looking at a cross section of this piece of tissue. And he's making a decision based on his feelings and his knowledge of these, these lesions. But if I showed a dysplastic mole to 10 pathologists, I might get one who says, this is melanoma. I might get eight that says, this is very dysplastic. And I get one who goes, Mah, it's so-so, it's, it's not so bad. So there is some variation and it's really important for we as dermatologists to know our pathologists and to know who they are and, and their philosophies and what they think is abnormal, what they think is atypical. And so it's not just shopping around, you know, looking for the cheapest pathologist in the neighborhood. You really have to know the person that you trust them because we're trusting them with our patients and we want to make sure we treat our patients properly. Love that. Okay, one lighter question to end with. Um, if we do go out in the sun and we do get a burn, what can we do? What should we do? Is there anything we oh, can do? Taking aspirin. Taking aspirin the first, you know, the first few hours after a sunburn is very helpful. It's an anti-inflammatory. It does help decrease the sunburn. Um, we do have interesting things. We, we found ways of, um, you really don't change the damage that was done. What's damage is probably done done. Uh, we can do things to help the sunburn <laughs> in oh, terms okay. of the feeling, but um, once, once, you, once you've created the burn, the DNA damage, the genetic issues are done. Um, and what well, best we can do is prevent future sunburns okay. and realize, you know, you missed that spot. Why did you miss that spot? Um, so it's important, you know, there are people use, um, um, you know, a, a, a buddy or a friend <laughs> to make sure those areas are covered on, on, on the back or on the sides. And you really have to really make sure you rub it in. And one thing I was going to say about, about sunblocks is, you know, the, the sprays, which I love to use myself, um, there, you don't just spray them on. I see people just spray them on and walk away. You have to spray them on and then rub them in. You have to spread them around. Otherwise you're going to have streaks. Uh, of areas of burn in protected areas. So you got to rub things in, make sure you cover everything. Uh, if you're outside, you know, doing activities for several hours, you're on the beach for several hours, you have to reapply sunblock. It's, it's good, as I mentioned, it might be good for five hour application if you're wearing an SPF for 50, uh, 30, um, but you, it wears off, it sweats off your body. You go in the ocean, you go in the pool, it rubs off your body. So it's probably best to reapply your sunblock at least every two hours uh, when you're outdoors for long periods of time. Uh, and make sure you cover those areas as best you can. And wear a hat. Women don't like to wear hats, but you know what? I see so many skin cancers on women's heads, right in the part line. And if they wore hats, they wouldn't have that problem. People don't think, well, I didn't put sunblock up here. I put it everywhere else but my scalp. And that's the area that's getting the most sun. Wear hats. Wow, Dr. Burns. And I don't have any, any financial interest in hats, although I need my own. <laughs> Well, this has been extremely informative. Um, I thought I was good and now you just shocked me. So I think everyone probably learned a lot. I hope you all found this as informative as I did. I know Dr. Bernstein gave a lot of information and showed a lot of pictures. So this is recorded. We will be sharing it this weekend. If you wanna see it right now, you can go onto Facebook because we were streaming live on our Facebook page. Um, but otherwise, I really hope this was helpful for everyone. I want to encourage you, let's not become one of these cases that Dr. Bernstein will show in his next webinar. 
um, come in for your skin check, please schedule it. It is covered by most insurance um, every year. So there's no reason not to come in and schedule a skin check with us or any board certified dermatologist. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein, for all your time today. Thank you for spending the afternoon with me. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.